We are live. Welcome to Wonder Woman 1984 Review and Thoughts, Wonder Woman 2. A movie set in the year 1984 and which feels like it's been getting delayed constantly since the year 1984. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the view, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. See its length. Check the time codes in the description box. I wanted to watch this in a theater when it came out, you know, yeah, but it did not play at any that are near me, so now I got myself a copy, and yeah, here we are. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so, and Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in the fran in this franchise. If I spoil any that came out after this movie did, then I will hold up an index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie. And once again, not for later entries in the franchise, or if I do, I'll hold up an index finger. And yeah, so real quick, the DCEU, Man of Steel is fine. It's a 7 out of 10. My issues with it are summed up very nicely by folding ideas. Batman v Superman is a mess for many reasons, explained well by Folding Ideas and Renegade Cut. I give it a 3 out of 10. The original Suicide Squad movie can be entertaining, but it's a complete mess due to the editing. Also explained well by Folding Ideas and Renegade Cut. And now that he's done a video on it, I can add to the list that Cosmo Variety Hour does a great job as well. 5 out of 10. The first Wonder Woman solo movie is excellent. 9 out of 10. The original Justice League is bad. 6 out of 10. I haven't watched the Snyder Cut yet. I am getting to it. And then we're back to the excellent ones. Aquaman, 8 out of 10. Shazam, 8 out of 10. Birds of Prey, 8 out of 10. I think the DCU is at its best when a director with a compelling vision is at the helm, especially when they're allowed an R rating and a lot of creative freedom. By far, some of the best are Birds of Prey, Joker, and The Suicide Squad. Not in all ways, but overall, I would say The Suicide Squad is the very best DCU film, in my opinion. And... Yeah. Let's see. So, content warning and or trigger warning. Let's see. Abuse. Gaslighting. Xenophobia. Body horror. Class struggles. Yeah. So the... Right. And... Rape. And the... Yeah. This is the part of the video where I talk about if some... Uh, uh, yeah. If there's any of the potentially triggering content, I think would be a good idea to remove, I definitely think that the rape would be very easy to write out, and I think the movie would be better without it. Also, please note that I have a tendency to sometimes, when I'm discussing a sensitive subject, use descriptive terms that I consider neutral, that other people consider negative. So if I say something that sounds judgmental, it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive, not judgmental. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Also, the movie I'm talking about has sensitive subjects that I I could be more well educated on. I'm gonna try to do my best not to put my foot in my mouth. But if I at some point in this video say something that reeks of soft breath, again I assure you I'm not intentionally being disrespectful. Let's see. So yeah, the movie is rated PG-13, and so is this video. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So 
feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. Let's see. So, yeah. I got this movie on sale, so I didn't have to pay very much money to watch it. So anything negative I said in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, trailers and other marketing, earlier or later movies in the franchise, or, you know, the movie Monster, which was written and directed by the same, by, by Patty Jenkins also. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So... In, in some ways, this movie is like the first one, so I'm not going to mention all of the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they're different from one another so that I'm not just repeating myself. And yeah, so in order to follow this movie's plot, you know, it helps a lot if you watched the first Wonder Woman solo movie. You don't really need to have watched the original cut of Justice League. I wouldn't know about the Snyder Cut, but yeah, you know, the movie does, as bad as this movie does get at times, it does build on some of the best things of the first solo movie. Of course, it can also really sour your enjoyment of the first solo film. I doubt that's going to be the case for me, but, you know, there's always that risk with something like this. Now, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, yeah, this is my first viewing of the movie. I watched it today. You know, I mean, by now it's been a little, it's been like 30 minutes or so. I recorded my video on you know, this week's episode of What If, before I started recording this video. Now, what is the story of Wonder Woman 1984? An idealistic, unusually talented woman wants to improve the world. She throws herself into it, despite a number of obstacles, due to circumstances, some of which we as the audience can't completely explain. Things start to get out of hand, and despite her tremendous talents, it will be a huge challenge for her to fix everything. One big problem, which is sadly all too easy to understand and explain, is the careless behavior of a con man that a number of people trust because of his television appearances. They think it will solve every single problem they have. He promises to be able to give the people who believe in him exactly what they want, but every time he tries, things go wrong. He's clearly out of his depth. It's largely fortunate for most people that he's so bad at what he tries to do. He even gets access to the White House, and what he does there substantially slows down this idealistic woman, and that causes a big issue. I, huh, that actually describes the plot of the movie as well. I was actually talking about the movie's production history. Maybe I need to explain what I mean with that last part. Obviously, by con man, I'm referring to Donald Trump. What I'm saying is he mishandled Corona so badly that this movie ended up spending a lot of time in post-production, and I would say many of the biggest problems with the movie are due to its long post-production. Obviously, this is easily one of the least bad things that Corona led to. There are far bigger issues, but yeah. Now. So, yeah. According to IMDb, this is an action-adventure fantasy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The action can be fun and exciting, and I don't know if it's to its benefit. It's probably more to its detriment, but it's not really ashamed of the fantasy roots. And... Yeah, so this is the part of the video where I get into some of the themes. I'm just going to quote a few fellow critics here. Consequently, one of the themes in this franchise appears to be the many sacrifices she makes to keep the world safe, something many of her male DC counterparts have not had to do over the years. Themes are stated and underlined even though this is at the cost of nuance. 
the movie does uh, uh, I'm not sure I would say good job it it tries to explore the greed and excess of the 1980s now the Right, I guess one more movie to briefly give, you know, I also love the Captain Marvel solo movie. That's an 8 out of 10 for me. So, the title, 1984, is also the title of a dystopian social science fiction novel written by George Orwell. It is one of his most well-known novels, along with Animal Farm, which I'm pretty sure was children's book, so 1984 was quite a departure. I'm kidding. You should see the look on your face right now. Obviously, I know Animal Farm is this satirical, allegorical novella. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, with that terrible joke out of the way, the movie doesn't really live up to invoking 1984. I, I mean, there are what is it, six, seven other years of the 80s that it could have been named after. When you use the term 1984, you're specifically invoking this idea of mass surveillance. And the movie isn't really very much about surveillance, like, or, or like unchecked government power, which the movie also isn't really about. I... It seems like they, they really wanted to set the movie in the 80s. And, I mean, honestly, they could have just, if they just called it Wonder Woman 2 and just start the movie by making it clear we're in the 1980s, that's all you really need. You don't need, I, I don't think it was a good idea to call it Wonder Woman 1984. Now, for those who don't know, I watch and review pretty much every single comic book adaptation movie that goes to theaters, and you know, in this case, didn't go to a theater near me, but you know, you could buy a copy of. Anyway, this is one of the cases where I was really looking forward to it. I might have chosen to watch this movie, even if it wasn't something I was already going to watch. So, the fact that it sucks is a bummer for me. I. I don't think there's anything that could truly sour my enjoyment of the original Wonder Woman. I think it's it's one of the best of of these comic book adaptations. It's it's I I don't think that Patty Jenkins is entirely to blame here. I think that once the movie had a really long post, you know, a lot of time to be in post production, then you know, some producers started getting really nervous about some of the things that were in the movie and they forced Patty to cut around them or do awkward reshoots. And I think that's a lot of the explanation for why the movie is... Because it doesn't feel like... It doesn't feel like a fully coherent vision of one person. And, again, like, if you compare it to, you know, Monster and the first Wonder Woman, like, I'm not saying they're perfect, they're extremely close to perfect, but there's probably something in there that you could hypothetically criticize, but they're definitely, they're coherent, they're, they're completely coherent as, as the vision of Patty Jenkins, you know, the, the like, the... One thing about the original Solo movie, once again, I am spoiling other DCU movies, ones that came out before this movie here. The the climactic fight between Diana and Ares is the one thing, and that was something that they forced upon, you know, they, they producers looked at the, the movie and said, you have to have a big, noisy, brightly colored, or not, not brightly colored, but like, you know, blindingly bright 
you know, big CG climax here. And so, you know, she went in and she, yeah, she, she put that in there. And that's, yeah, other than that, there really isn't very much that it makes sense to, in my opinion, to criticize. But with this one, there's a lot of problems. And I get that maybe some of it was that no one was telling her no. No one stopped her from the decisions, but some of it really does look like it's the... Yeah. So, since I'm going to be talking about the, the political... I am personally progressive. I want women to be able to express themselves. I want them to be respected. I don't think movies should be dictated by what men think is okay to put in movies. But I do think that this movie makes some mistakes and I'm I'm trying to approach that I'm 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 trying to approach that as not what I you know what I'm used to being in movies made by men but just what you know does does it ultimately you know coherent yeah does it all go together are there aspects of the movie that that sabotage other aspects basically so it's pretty terrible that I have to say the following, but some people won't watch the movie if they aren't assured of the following. Not every straight white cis man in this film is depicted as being evil, inferior, etc. There are major characters that fall into those cat categories, including at least one major character. And... I mean, I... I think, are there, let's see, the, the, it definitely, it paints, the movie basically does depict the average man as being creepy and being overly aggressive, sexually aggressive with women. And, you know, not really taking no for an answer and such. And, you know, otherwise ignoring women if they don't think they're attractive enough. Or don't think they can get anything out of them. But really the... And that is obviously, you know, that is a huge problem in society today. I'm not sure that I would really say that it paints very many male characters or female characters as just evil. It, it tries to humanize most of the major characters and I would say it largely succeeds. I will not be talking about the film I know, I know it's a term that's being reclaimed, I'm not comfortable with saying it, so I'm gonna say Q-baiting, or other LGBTQ aspects, I don't feel qualified to do so, and I think Melina Pendulum did an excellent job covering it. I am aware that some of the objectionable things in this movie are also in other movies, you know, dealing with the 1980s, especially ones made during the 1980s, and also other comic book movies, but that doesn't make it okay. If anything, that should inspire you to try to do better. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, quoting fellow critics, the two main selling points of the previous film, as with this one, are the female protagonist and the female director. But as with the previous one, this feminist fable comes to life only when the supermodel in the lead bears her legs and shoulders. And I've never seen so many close-ups on shoes or heard so many jokes 
about high heels in a film. Surely the whole point is to show audiences that everyone can enjoy films made by women, not to alienate men with jokes about how difficult it is to walk in high heels. I mean, I feel like when women do things that, you know, where, where people are like, well, that kind of alienates men, I feel like that gets criticized way more harshly than when male directors put things in movies that alienate women. I, again, I'm not saying two wrongs don't make a right, but I don't really, I don't think it's wrong to make a movie that caters to an audience that's been largely ignored. I, I feel like if a lot of movies are made like this, then eventually, you know, people who can't relate to them will just have to accept that it's becoming part of culture. And, you know, I mean, it's not for everyone, but it doesn't have to be for everyone. Technically, nothing is for everyone. You know, oxygen, drinking fluids, that's for everyone. But no piece of entertainment is for everyone. The, the, um, yeah, I just, I feel like there are so many movies where women are expected to identify with male characters, and so few where, yeah, where it focuses on the, on the female characters. I don't think that that's really a big problem for the movie, personally. Now, let's see. Okay, so yeah, another critic here. In the hashtag MeToo era, there has been a wave of films with hostile views towards men, and WW84 falls into that category. Nearly every man on screen except Chris Pine is portrayed as a misogynist or predator of some kind, leading women are catcalled and assaulted by random men whose purpose seems to be to cement the idea that women are victims in a male-dominated society. I mean, that is a huge problem. I, do, I don't really understand why a movie bringing that up is supposed to be some big problem. There are countless movies that objectify women that are extremely misogynist. I, I really don't, like, I don't get the vibe from this film that all men are terrible. I get the vibe that a number of men engage in behavior towards women that is terrible. I, I don't really, what, like... There, there are so many movies where the, the, you know, certain behavior, like, yeah, the way I see it, the movie is saying men should not behave like this. It's not saying all men always behave like this. Now. Yeah, and another critic. It doesn't always work, but Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot's superhero sequel attempts to rebuke the last 20 years worth of masculine-coded blockbuster filmmaking. And yeah, this critic gave it a 6 out of 10. So, but but yeah, I really admire the, the attempt. What is the message of all this mess? Being with a man makes you weak. Wanting a man makes you murderous. And that's, yeah, it, it doesn't, the movie doesn't completely realize what messages it is communicating. And again, I think some of that is the, the stuff that was, that was removed or changed during the long post-production. Wonder Woman 1984 doesn't pander or condescend to its female audience members, and for that, I applaud it. But it does something that, upon reflection, is perhaps even more unforgivable. It shows little interest in them at all. And, yeah, honestly, no, I, I don't really agree with that. I, 
I put that in to see, you know, I read that before watching the movie, and I was like, is that really true? So I copied it in here, and yeah, in case you read it on your own, I'm saying I don't think that's true. It's always sad when the highlight of a female-led film are the two male supporting characters, and I mean, for sure they are the, yeah, two, two of the biggest, two of the most compelling characters. Bigger, bolder, with leg warmers attached to legs that ain't afraid, afraid to kick a sexist pig where it counts. So, I cannot comment on the 3D because, you know, I didn't get to watch it in theaters and... I don't even know if there is a 3D DVD through the 3D Blu-ray out of this, but if there is, that's not one I own. I don't have a 3D Blu-ray player, I think it's called. This movie retcons some things from BBS and Justice League. Thank God. So I will not be criticizing this movie for introducing things that would have been very useful Diana to use for Diana to use in one of the movies set after this one but made before this one that's I get why it bothers people but I don't think it's the job of a movie to make itself worse in order to make bad movies seem better by comparison like yeah in this movie she has some powers that would have come in handy in those two movies but those are two badly written badly made movies Okay, from some of the technical aspects are quite good, but it's, I really don't think it's right to expect this movie to lower itself by not including, yeah. Unfortunately, the some of those things don't otherwise make the movie better, but I don't, I don't think you should judge the movie based on it having things that yeah. I mean, let's be honest. Zack Snyder, once again, I haven't watched the Snyder Cut. Maybe that one is way better. But in BVS, like, Snyder wasn't doing that good a job with Wonder Woman. I don't, I don't begrudge this movie for wanting to do a better job. Now, the movie was written by Patty Jenkins, who also wrote monster she did not write the the first wonder woman solo movie but yeah i love the writing of monster i was hoping i would love the writing of this movie but yeah you know this movie like birds of prey is both written and directed by women which yeah i mean i i wish i could unreservedly praise this movie the way i did birds of prey but unfortunately, it does have some some issues, some major issues. So, the following is partially inspired and informed by the Birdman's video, Everything Wrong with CinemaSins, Wonder Woman 1984. Since this movie is written and directed by women, it is a female-led superhero movie where the woman is allowed to feel feelings, with a woman featured the women featured are allowed to indulge in things that women are frequently shamed for, in part because they're considered negative female stereotypes, but given that this was made by women, I would be extremely surprised if they're present here because these women didn't feel like it would be okay for them to go against stereotypes. While we do still, while we still do not have that many female-led movies, especially in genres considered male-centric, like superhero and other comic book adaptations, a lot of the ones there are present the women as basically masculine, or rather a popular stereotype of masculinity. Emotionless, tough, punches a lot of people. But yeah, some of the, the stereotypes that this, you know, does engage with are impractical choice of footwear, sentimentality, close relationships, whether friendships with other women, women, or... I, I know how to pronounce the word women. I don't know why it keeps slipping up. Or romantic relationships with men, female relatives meaning a lot to them. Yeah, as I, 
I believe the movie is trying to reclaim these things, but and and sort of say that it's okay to you know women don't have to stop being women in order to be respectable. I I don't know if it always does a really great job of of getting there, unfortunately. Now, it was also, the movie was also written in part by Jeff Johns, who also wrote the story for Aquaman, and, yeah, he, he did a, I'm, I'm aware not everybody agrees with me on this, but I do think that movie has a good, not incredible, not flawless story. And David Callahan, who wrote the, let's see, The Expendables... Let's see, he apparently did not write The Expendables 2. It was just based on his writing for the first one. He did a production rewrite uncredited on Ant-Man. He wrote Zombieland, Double Tap. He co-wrote it with Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick. Yeah. So, oh, right, and Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings. So, yeah, that's... So, so Shang-Chi has excellent writing, but some of these others definitely do have issues. So the, yeah, the first one has a few weaknesses in the writing. Unfortunately, largely, this one does not do a better job. You know, what a lot of people said was the, the writing is messy, the plot is badly thought out and sloppily told. There are a lot of abilities that will solve a problem in one scene, but the ability will be awkwardly introduced in that scene and then never used in any later scenes. There are problems with logic, script, etc. Now, the... Right. Despite those, you know, I'm not saying that the f some of the time the movie did make me feel the things that it was trying to make the audience feel. I'm not saying that makes those problems okay, but it is a silver lining. I, th I think it's important to acknowledge when something like this does get something right. On multiple occasions, characters guess where the other characters are going so that a big fight or other action scene can happen. Quoting fellow critics here, the film also has some tonal issues, largely due to how many different genres Jenkins is trying to juggle within one film. Certain scenes play out like a campy 80s comedy, while others play out like a big budget action movie. Most scenes work well, but there are a few scenes that seem a bit too much. I understand why there was the whole scene with the drunk business guy trying to force himself on Barbara, but when that character is revisited later in the film, it feels somewhat unnecessary. The best scenes in Wonder Woman 1984 aren't the action scenes, but rather the ones spent with the characters interacting with each other, with, with one another as regular people. The action is no doubt big and exciting, but those smaller intimate moments with the characters are ultimately where I feel the film really shines. And what fans need are bold acts of heroism that jump off the big screen and demand that be seen with a crowd of strangers, and Wonder Woman 1984 has some of that, but nowhere near enough. And if those fans require a narrative to pull together the action scene sequences, they will be, they'll be hugely disappointed. Thousands of extras appear and disappear when the plot requires it. People who are miles away from each other manage to bump into each other at the appropriate moment, too often, characters do exactly what they just said they'd never do. Little is made of perhaps the most hilariously misjudged superhero rescue effort that's all the more cack-handed at that point. We've been waiting seemingly hours to see the eponymous hero in her full heroine in her full garb. You have to wonder why the 1980s were even chosen as this sequel, when mo modern-day social media would connect with younger audiences and fit the message every bit as much as the 80s infomercials. Weak spots. The failures of WW84 lie in the hands of director, writer, producer Pat Jenkins. WW84 is all thriller, no action. 
which is a death sentence for a superhero film. The runtime of two hours and 30 minutes moves at the pace of a wounded man crawling on a trail of broken glass. Feels like this would be better suited for an episode of TV than a two and a half hour film. While Wonder Woman 1984 still has a bit of the old magic and it lead, its leads all turn in terrific performances, the film is hampered by frequently nonsensical plot, extraneous showy action sequences, and it's way too heavy handed with the moralizing. My major complaint about Wonder Woman 1984 is that it plods along for two and a half hours. The screenplay needed to lose some of, the, some of its subplots. Too much time is spent running around in plot circles, biding time until the grand finale. In the MCU, Mjolnir is consistent with what it can do. In this movie, the lasso can do anything the writers wanted to at that time. The wish logic is bad. Wishing can do anything the writers feel like at the time. Terrible moral message, illogical. One of the problems is that Patty Jenkins, when making this movie, was unable or unwilling to kill her darlings. Among other things, the race at the start of the movie was something that she wanted in the first movie, but couldn't fit in there. So now she put it in this movie, even though it doesn't need to be there and shouldn't be there. And I really, I, I empathize because it, I mean, she knew what she wanted to do with it. It's, you know, some people say it's the one of the best scenes. Some people say it's one of the worst scenes. The reason why we, you know, I, I think it is one of the best scenes. It's unfortunate that it doesn't matter much more because it's really well done and emotionally engaging exciting but the reason why some people say it's the worst is that you could remove it and you lose nothing other than just the enjoyment of the scenes like i defy you find someone who hasn't watched this movie yet show them the entire rest of the movie and see if they Un, like understand it less than those of us who did watch the entire movie it just that just isn't the case and just you know but patty wanted more than mascara and diana left in the first movie and you know we were told that she couldn't yeah she is I forget the exact wording, but it was something like, you may never return, which I don't know if that means maybe you'll never return or you can never return. I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, you know, Patty Jenkins wanted more, more Themyscira, more Diana on Themyscira, and she also very specifically wanted these. The, the scene is basically like the Olympics, but on Themyscira, and I mean, I mean, if you don't, if that concept doesn't, like, bring light to your soul, I, d I don't know how to talk to you. That is that is objectively amazing. That's, that's such a cool idea. And, you know, it's, it's in the comics. It's one of the things that people love about the comics. But there's just, there's no real reason for it to be there. And, yeah, it's 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 too bad. And another thing, obviously, Patty Jenkins wanted more of, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Lily Aspel, who played young Diana in the first movie as well. And, again, you can understand why. she's She's great in both movies. And it's one of those things, you know, how do you bring back a character, how do you bring back an actor who played a younger version of a character that we now see as an adult, you know, so that was, yeah. I mean, Diana, you know, Gal Gadot delivers some narration and she, she kind of says, she says something like, you know, some days she barely remembers being on Themyscira, but other days 
it feels like she only just left, so something like that. And then we get this scene. So it is basically, it's essentially her reliving it in her memory in present, in, in 1984, you know. But that doesn't, like... That doesn't justify its length and the yeah and it isn't that otherwise the start of the movie doesn't have action because very very soon after i i didn't count but not very much screen time passes between the end of that sequence and then the first time we see her as wonder woman and it 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 almost kind of feels like the like if i didn't know that patty jenkins always wanted it to be in the movie i would have guessed that it was something they came up with really late because it doesn't it doesn't need to be there and doesn't tie into anything and it's not to address a lack of action scenes you know that that is like a number of cases with reshoots that's because like they went you know they they bought like producers would would look at a rough cut and they'd be like well there's a there's a chunk of the movie here with no action you know if that was the case then the scene should have been moved you know to to the, there is a chunk of this movie that has almost no action but it's not the start of the movie and and I wouldn't I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to get rid of the Wonder Woman action scene that follows it because that scene is basically telling us this is what it, you know, it's, it's telling us, forget what the other movies said, yes, Diana was active as a superhero in, you know, in, in between 1917 and 2015, I, I forget if it's, that's when, the, that's when BVS came out. I'm not 100% certain when that movie is set. But, yeah. You know, it's, it's telling us, yes, she is doing heroic things. Which also, like, if you remove that, then she ends up feeling extremely selfish. If she's not going around using her superpowers to help people, you know. Once again, Zack Snack, like, why would you even write that? Who writes that this, like... Like, if you took some random character no one cares about, but Wonder Woman matters to people. She gives, like, she's something for, for you know, young women and, and little girls to look up to. And he takes this character and says, she, sat, she, she didn't do anything for a hundred years because it's just... Anyway, you know, the movie tells us that, that things... Yeah, she she is still she is active in the eighties as Wonder Woman, and yeah, the the yeah that is that is everything I have to say about the opening scene. I forget if I put it anywhere else in these notes, so I'll real quick say it now that I'm, that I remember it. I'm not the first to point it out, but the inciting incident of the movie happens way too late in the movie compared to when it should. And I should, yeah, spoilers for this movie. Basically, it happens, I want to say 53 minutes in to a movie that is two hours and 26 minutes without any credits. And honestly, you could extremely easily have it happen maybe 15 or 20 minutes in. No more spoilers for the time being. So, plot twists. The movie doesn't do a particularly good job with plot twists. I don't... I wouldn't say there are too many or too few, but they are, a lot of them are bad, and a couple of them are too easy to figure out for the viewer, and yet, like, 
spends forever before getting to the payoff. You know, the uh, if you if you guess a twist like right away, like if you if you guess a twist way before the the twist happens in the movie, you know, it's not always like that the writing could have been better, but sometimes it is. And yeah, there are a couple of things in here that just, yeah. So let's see the Yeah, so the movie is yeah, directed by Patty Jenkins, who also directed Wonder Woman One and Monster. Oh right, back when I thought I was gonna get to watch this in theaters, I rewatched Monster on the fourteenth of September last year. Yeah. Which, you know, I'll take any excuse to rewatch Monster. I've probably watched it at least 20 times by now. Sometimes I talk about whether the... Actually, yeah, never mind. First, I'll get to... I, th I think some of the time she has a very sure hand in directing. Like, there are definitely times where she gets the emotion... She gets the the atmosphere and effect that she's looking for. But then other times where, like, some of the scenes of the film, it kind of feels like she doesn't really want to do them, but the base like there are there are scenes in the film where characters like they have to move from one plot point to another. So there's, you know, there's exposition, there's character interaction. And several of them, it just feels like Patty Jenkins doesn't really want to be doing them. And, yeah, like, the, the, ah, what's the word? It feels like she knows she has to do them, that not every scene can be like, you know, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't know if she's that devoted to making sure a lot of actions, she does good, she does a good job on, at the action scenes, she has, there, there are some issues, but the action scenes tend to be, you know, they, they're good with some elements that are a little, but like, you know, like some some people say, oh, women can't direct action movies. You're watching the wrong ones. That's that's all. But the yeah, she like both in this and in in the original solo movie, like she knows how to do action, and certainly in the first one, there's there's a like there's some really emotional actions like the the crossing no man's land for example is you know and, and others have already pointed out there's there's nothing like that in this one there's nothing even remotely that emotional in, as far as action scenes in this one i would say the movie goes for that level of emotion in other scenes but but no like the uh not every scene can be Gal Gadot as Diana being like really stunning. Whether, you know, it's not always as Wonder Woman. Sometimes it's just, you know, she she's really honest about something. Or, you know, and it, it feels like those are what Patty Jenkins is most you know, most devoted to, and yeah, it it just feels like she isn't as interested in the, in the other ones. Now the, you know, sometimes I talk about the, the, ah, what's it called? Right, the, the, the impact 
that a certain movie had on, you know, the career of, for example, the director. Currently, Patty Jenkins is still set to direct the next Star Wars movie, Rogue Squadron, which, yeah, sign me up. IMDb says she's also set to direct Cle uh, Cle Cleopatra, Cleopatra and Wonder Woman 3, but IMDb, you know, they don't always update. So I, I don't know about those, but let's see. I, I do, I hope that I hope she gets to write and direct Wonder Woman 3 and that nothing happens that messes up the post-production and maybe that she you know i uh, yeah you know i i think she can do a really great job still so let's see Um, yeah, I already talked about the the Themyscira Olympics, and now not long after that, we see how Diane's life in 1984 is both when she's just a civilian and clearly misses, you know, Steve. Can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I think it's no, it's not written here. Steve Trevor, there it is. And we also see her doing her Wonder Woman thing, and it does a, a good job of, like, it even, that scene even basically does get the ball rolling on the core plot. You know, she's in a mall, and she stops some, uh, I guess they're called they're they're bank yeah not bank they're robbers I think is is the you know she stops these robbers and that does lead I'm I'm not sure I'm gonna detail exactly why but that does lead into the plot so you know hypothetically it's good it just it takes way too long yeah yeah part of it is it's getting bogged down in subplots before it gets to the inciting incident, even though it starts things off very early like that. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it does fit what came before. I don't think it's that good of an ending, but I certainly some things you can clearly tell what they were going for. I think a, a strong argument could be made that there's some deus ex machina and some other convenient writing. Now, I mean, yeah, just real quick, spoiler for the ending. Where the first solo movie becomes this big, noisy, orange, blinding CGI mess in the climax, that doesn't happen here. And that is good, at least. And they actually... They were dealing with a thing where, like, they could have had Diana fighting, a, you know, an ancient god in the climax, but they were worried that it would end up too similar to the first one. So they did something else so you know they they did learn some you know some lessons from making the first one no more spoilers for the time being actually yeah, real, real quick, a few more spoilers, major spoilers. So, the first movie, you know, 
The ending does relate to the core conflict of whether or not mankind deserves saving if men are truly good in their hearts. You know, with that said, the ending of the first one also gets a little confusing, or perhaps I should say confused, as at first it appears that Steve is right, that it's not about Ares, men will wage war without the influence of gods, but then once Ares dies, the war ends immediately. And, you know, in this movie, it's not about whether or not, you know, human beings are inherently good or bad or somewhere in between. It's this idea... It's this idea of the, the 1980s, people would have... Yeah, people were really greedy and such, and ultimately could overcome that. So, yeah, I get why they thought that that would work compared to the, the first one. Yeah. No more spoilers for the time being. So, this movie does have a mid credits scene. So, if you're watching it for the very first time, you know, sh sit through the first chunk of credits, but there isn't anything at the very end credits. So, you don't have to sit through all of them. And I'll completely understand if you want to stop watching as soon as the as soon as you're sure there are no more mid credits or post credit scenes so uh, yeah does the movie lose your interest along the way yeah it, it your your interest wanes in over the viewing of this some parts are more enjoyable to watch than others I'm not sure I'd say it's worth suffering through the, the bad parts to get to the good parts. Now, let's see. So the... Yeah, so as far as superpowers... This one, you know, when 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 Diana does get into Wonder Woman mode, she does use her powers well and a lot, and it's easy to follow what she's doing. Now, but I did already mention the 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 um, lasso of truth not being consistent that brings us to the characters so Gal Gadot as Diana Prince slash Wonder Woman so from Wikipedia Gadot spoke about the character's evolution, saying in the first film, Diana really is a fish out of water, coming from Themyscira into man's world, learning about the complexities of human life, really. In Wonder Woman 1984, she's been around, she's wiser, she's more mature, she's guarded and lost all her friends throughout the years, but she's still doing the right thing, yet she is different from when we last saw her. Gadot added, in the first movie, you really explored the journey of the coming of age, of how Diana Prince became Wonder Woman, owned her full strengths, and powers so yeah you know she's not as you know naive and inexperienced as in the first one not as jaded as in BBS to slightly lesser extent Justice League and yeah so so Doug Walker said that there are a number of times where it seems like Gadot didn't really believe the words she was saying she was processing what she was saying either as she was saying it or right after it didn't feel she, like she was saying something that she had thought of herself. And, yeah, it. Some people say that she should have put in more effort. I don't think the problem is effort. I think it is just that the first one played to her strengths. And I'm just not sure this one does... I, I think she's okay as Diana, you know, civilian Diana, especially like there's, there's an early scene where she talks to Barbara Minerva and she, 
like, you know, basically Barbara looks up to Diana and she's like, oh, you must have lived this incredible life. And Diana says, we, my life isn't what you think. Yeah, so, so, something like that. My life hasn't been what you think it has. We all have our struggles. And that really works. I, you know, I, I love that line since I first heard it in the trailer. It's, it's such a great, like, display of, of, of empathy and just, that, that really works. But, yeah, a lot of the time, it, it doesn't really, yeah. I, I don't know, I, it's, In, in the first one, like, a lot of the time she's reacting to, like, the way things, yeah, the, the way thing you know, the, the normal way of things during World War One in, you know, ah, I forget, was it England or America? I guess it was England, wasn't it? And, you know, near the, ah, what's it called? Uh, no man's land. She, yeah, she was reacting to the way things were there, and yeah, for for most of that, she's convincing. But in this, yeah, I, I think she is mature. I think she is as mature as the this movie depicts Diana. But. Yeah, I mean, acting, it's a, sometimes an actor will be incredible at playing the opposite of what they're like in real life. You know, off the top of my head, Keanu Reeves, really good at playing, you know, these kind of dark anti-hero characters where in real life he's just the nicest guy. But then if they have to play something that's very similar to themselves, they don't, yeah, they, they struggle with that. And yeah, I I think maybe she had an easier time, like, imagining being this, this inexperienced person. And then when she has to be more like herself, she's... She struggles to, yeah, you know, she has to carry a lot of the movie on her shoulders, and yeah, she just, she, she can't, sadly. She she couldn't in, in this, maybe in the future. Now, let's see. Yeah, so quoting fellow critics here. Gadot's even better in this go-round with the action scenes, and when called upon to stretch dramatically, she does her best screen work to date, but it's not quite enough to make the picture work. All the potential for her character and for the sequel, her fighting abilities, the kind of villains she could face, the action scenes, feels dulled here. In the end, somehow I wanted more of Wonder Woman. In the end, this movie never makes the case for why Wonder Woman is back in action beyond the obvious commercial imperatives. They don't engage with Wonder Woman's true power of compassion when her superhuman strength proves more cinematic for shallow blockbuster thrills. It's all smoke and mirrors. Now, let's see. Wonder Woman 1984 does an astounding job of making its central heroine into a warrior for love and peace. Now, the... Let's see. I don't... Yeah, you know, the action scenes she absolutely delivers, and, like, yeah, and Lily Asbel replies, reprises her role as young Diana from the 2017 film, and she actually performed all the required physical stunt work herself at the age of 12, because it was deemed that she did the job better than her own stunt doubles. And back to critics. Far more compelling is the film's opening sequence, a flashback to a pivotal moment in the life of young Diana, years before she'd become Wonder Woman. 
As a girl on the magical island of Themyscira, played once again by the poised and perfectly cast Lily Aspel, she competes in an arduous challenge of strength and skill against women twice her age and height. This whole section soars. The camera work and editing put us right in the middle of the action, and Hans Zimmer's score sweeps us along. The memory also efficiently establishes Diana's fearlessness and ability as well as the important lessons she learns about the nature of truth that will become relevant down the road. It's the film's high point. Nothing else will match it in terms of visual cohesion or emotional impact. I think the it might be the scene that... I'm not sure the, the producers at all messed with that scene, and maybe that's why it is so good but also so long. We open up with a flashback sequence of Diana's childhood in which she competes in Olympics-type sporting event at her home realm of Themyscira. This overlong action sequence has zero impact on the following film and is one of the two IMAX shot sequences, neither of which involve any fighting nor leave a lasting impact on the experience of the film, a waste of use for the best camera in the world. Arguably, the, the sequel's best scene comes at the beginning, in a flashback to Themyscira, where a young Diana, Lily Aspel, competes in an Amazonian competition which teaches her true victory must come from sacrifice and that there are no shortcuts. The idea is meant to spill over to the rest of the film, but it doesn't fit as well as the trio of screenwriters may have hoped, which makes me wonder how many rewrites and edits the film went through before its final cut. Yeah, I could absolutely imagine. Originally, it... It went perfectly with the rest of the film. And they were so happy that they managed to work it in because they wanted it in there, you know. And Jeff Johns, I, I don't know for sure, but I could imagine he helped write that bit of the movie. And, you know, he, uh, I forget, I want to say he's a comics writer, but I forget. But he does, he mainly does comic books. He doesn't do very many movies. He's a huge fan of comic books. He wanted it in there. You know, he, he wanted stuff like that in there, certainly. Yeah, and then as they they rewrote, you know, eventually it no longer went as well with the rest of the movie, and they just couldn't kill their darlings. And Chris Pine returns to play Steve. Steve. Trevor, and let's see, the, yeah, so Diana knew Steve for maybe a week, 66 years ago, and yet she still does pine after Chris. Why doesn't she miss her own people more than him? She grew up with them, seems like they should matter more to her. And he he gives a pretty good performance. I I'm yeah I'm not sure I can really find any fault in his performance. The the writing of the character maybe, but not really his. You know, ultimately he doesn't get to do that much in the film. He kind of plays second fiddle to her and. You know, some some have said, oh, you know, it's it's great that a guy has to take this traditionally feminine, you know, usually it's a male-centric movie and the woman just has to hang around and and be attractive. But here they do, they, they swap the genders. And, you know, that is hypothetically fun, you know, but ultimately it just doesn't, you know, those movies were also poor for not having a fully realized character there. A, a you know, yeah, someone who really contributes, but he, he does contribute a little bit. But a lot of the time, he doesn't really get to do that much. Yeah. And Kristen Wiig plays Barbara Minerva. And... You know, the, the, let's see, I don't know how much I want to give away with, I'm going to just, spoilers for the movie. In addition to Barbara Minerva, Kristen Wiig plays Cheetah, 
she lets a grudge turn herself into a supervillain. The personal relationship between Minerva and Diana makes for tragedy, which was also an element in the first one. And, yeah, you know, she, yeah, highly insecure geologist and gemologist who befriends Diana before becoming imbued with it mystical abilities that gradually transform her into an apex predator like superhuman. She allies herself with Lord to fight Diana. A lot of people point to her being similar to Jim Carrey's Riddler, Jamie Foxx's Electro, Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. Thankfully not really Halle Berry's Catwoman. Sorry Mrs. Berry, you're incredibly talented. You deserve that Emmy for introducing Dorothy Dandridge. When it comes to Catwoman, it was the writing and direction. You did what you were asked to do. Anyway, the character starts out as insecure, unpopular, unattractive, then becomes a villain through her obsession with the titular hero, who they feel doesn't treat them well enough. You know, okay, so so Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, it's not the the titular hero, it's the it's her it's her boss. The the I forget what his character's name is, but it's Christopher Walken. But yeah. You know, the the yeah, like with those characters, she's too exaggerated. You know, those, those... Why did I write two characters? It's not three characters. Yeah. And... Yeah, you know, she's, she's lonely. No one's coming to get this Barbara. I think she does a... a she does a pretty decent job. Like, when, when she's playing a predator... You know, like her eyes and the way she talks and such. Like she's intense. It 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 works. You know, and she she does what she can to make the the awkward version of herself work. And it's not really her fault. It's the the way that the that it's written and directed. I would say. No more spoilers for the time being. And the role was first offered to Emma Stone, but she declined. The role was then offered to Kristen Wiig, Patty Jenkins' first choice. I th I could see Emma Stone in the role, but I do think, yeah, I'm 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 glad that it's Kristen Wiig. Quoting fellow critics, she puts in effort and her and her performance changes to fit the different aspects. If only Jenkins had done more with her, there are long stretches where Minerva becomes something of an afterthought, and when she finally, let's see, yeah, when she makes a crucial decision, this decision does not register in the way I'm certain it was designed to, and, let's see. yeah, so, they, when, you know, when they filmed this in 2019, Kristen Wiig was 46 years old, and yeah, you know, we don't see a lot of, you know, mid-40s women as, you know, such a major character in a blockbuster movie. It's it's really great to see, and it, I feel like it really underlines that she's there because of her talent, because she's, you know, Patty Jenkins was like, she's the exact right person to play this role. They didn't hire some 20-year-old that, you know, the, the hot new, yeah, the, the, the it girl, you know. And she, she at least didn't used to be known for action, I, I don't know, if she, but yeah, she's, she, she used to be known for comedy and you know, she's not really, like, I, I guess maybe for the the kind of exaggerated awkwardness, you know, that could maybe play to her strengths as a, as a comedian, but, yeah, you know, it's not that they're using that to draw people in. They, yeah, they hired her because they, they thought she could do a good job, and, yeah, she, she largely does, and... And Pedro Pascal plays Maxwell, Max Lord, and yeah, a struggling yet charismatic businessman, famous for TV infomercials, the founder of Black Gold Cooperative, and yeah, Jenkins said that 
his character is modeled on Bernie Madoff and Donald Trump. And let's see. Yeah, and director Patty Jenkins has stated Pascal's performance as Lord was inspired by Gordon Gecko from Oliver Stone's Wall Street and by Gene Hackman's portrayal of Lex Luthor in Richard Donner's 1978 Superman film. With Jenkins describing Lord as a villain with potential to be dangerous and scary. And. The character was originally modeled, when he was introduced in the comics, was originally modeled on the actor Sam Neill. Yeah. That is, that is not the way he's, I've, I've seen Sam Neill give some wild performances, but I can't really imagine him delivering the performance that Pascal does in this. Patty Jenkins and, uh, let's see, yeah, Pascal based his performance on Nicolas Cage. Now that I can see. That I definitely see in there. Like, I think if I hadn't read that before watching the movie, I think I might have been like, is it doing, is that Nicolas Cage? Is he trying to like, cause there are times where he'll just like really suddenly be like super excited or, or super low key. And these just, you know, the, the kinds of things, like when you watch a movie like Face Off, at least some of the time it's because he has like, you know, there's there's a scene where the the character is on drugs, and that's why he's suddenly like doing this weird smile that he does, or getting like, yeah, it just. And I mean, it's not completely unmotivated in this. He's being affected by something. So anyway. Patty Jenkins picked the 80s of the film's setting because she saw it as the height of Western civilization and society, so it offers the opportunity to explore how Wonder Woman would deal with the villains, with the types of villains that come from that era. And yeah, various critics say he steals the movie, especially from Barbara. Yeah, yeah, to, to some extent, I agree. I, I personally wanted more of Barbara but I, I get why people find him appealing. He's, he's definitely like, ah, there's a, it's, it's, yeah, it's that thing with, with like Nicolas Cage. Like you just, you kind of want to see what, what is he going to do or say next, you know? But yeah, quoting fellow critics here, Lord is a pale imitation of someone like Lex Luthor. One could almost call him Trumpian, except Lord has the rudiments of a conscience and actually cares about his child. Patty Jenkins' sequel is a well-intentioned but sloppy punch against Trumpism. And in in one interview, Pedro Pascal said that when I, I think it was that Patty Jenkins told him, Max wants to be cool, but he isn't. And the the actor said in an interview that helped his performance a lot. And yeah, like he's. Yeah, he's he's a lot of fun to watch, and there's definitely some of that in there that he he wants to be cool and doesn't. Uh, yeah, and you know, it was great to see Robin Wright as Antiope again, and Connie Nielsen as Hippolyta. I I wish that the the what's the word. I wish they were more relevant to the the movie. And let's see, that brings us Yeah, so Doug Walker said that the 
some of the actors in this act like they're in a Raimi Spider-Man movie, which works for those, but not for this. Yeah, I... I... I, I hate to say it, but that... Yeah. A source close to Jenkins described it as a standalone film in the same way that Indiana Jones or James Bond films are, instead of one continuous story that requires many installments. I respectfully disagree with Jenkins on taking this approach. I think it would have been a good idea to make it feel more of a direct continuation. I think that would have helped. Yeah, ultimately, like... I wanted Wonder Woman 2. I want 10 Wonder Woman solo movies. But you do have to have each of them kind of, like, even if you hate the first Wonder Woman solo movie, it is almost impossible to claim that the movie doesn't make a case for its own existence. If you have watched BVS, then watching... Wonder Woman 1 will help explain why Wonder Woman, you know, why did she disappear from the world of man for a hundred years? If you haven't watched BVS, then, you know, the first Wonder Woman solo movie is an exploration of World War I and is mankind inherently good, evil, or somewhere in between? You know, the, the movie is that even if you watch BVS, but if you watch BVS, you might be more compelled to find out why did she leave man, man's world behind for a hundred years. But this movie, I don't really know that there is much of a... If, if the movie really has much of a reason to exist, again, other than money and the fact that some of the, peop some of the people who helped make it really badly wanted to make another one I can't really point to it I can't say that there's and I it feels wrong to have to justify and if it was like if there weren't so many movies then maybe it wouldn't be necessary to justify but like you know I don't know over a hundred million dollars went into making this. You know, thousands of work hours. You know, a long, long post-production. A lot of passion. And the final product just isn't that... <sighs> yeah, you know, I, I, I wish I could say otherwise, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Quoting fellow critics here, Wonder Woman 1984 shines brightest when Gadot and Pine are on screen together. Yes. Wig is terrific, but there's just not enough of her. It truly is a wonder to see an A-lister like Chris Pine embrace the traditional female support role of the pretty sidekick so winningly, while Gadot is smooth as silk and never less than watchable. The team is here but this is most definitely a sequel. Gadot and Pine give great pillow talk, and their easy screwball rhythms provide not just levity, but ballast. They ground a movie in which time, for all its malleability, always feels like it's slipping away. Jenkins comes to the picture with thrilling determination at times, ready to throw down with one of the big screen's most popular superheroes. It's the two-villain sy syndrome that eats away at Wonder Woman 1984. A bloated, muddled endurance test, as Diana is no longer an innocent to the ways of the world, Gadot has less of a charm offensive at her disposal, and, ironically, the film only perks up whenever Chris Pine shares her scenes. Though Pedro Pascal and Kristen Wiig do their best to inject life into their respective villains, Wonder Woman 1984 is two and a half hour empty shell of pseudo-inspiration and laughably bad action. And... Let's see. Yeah, so the following is not a critic, but a comment on a critic's review. 
I enjoyed the movie. I'll take the contrary position that I liked how restrained it was about the 1980s stuff. I liked that it treated the 1980s as a real world where adults lived and worked and worried rather than a toy box of pop culture references. While I appreciate the scene with the punks time to update that destroy all movies book, overall I like that they mostly didn't feel the need to go the hot tub time machine, haha, a Walkman route. I'm a little mixed personally on how the I do at least hypothetically it's good that the movie doesn't go nuts with the kind of it doesn't feel the need to constantly you know like I'd say the movie Captain Marvel has way more 90s references than this has 80s references I think that worked for that movie, but I, it, you know, it doesn't work for every movie, and yeah, it, it was largely just the, the look, there wasn't any, there, there weren't that many, like, licensed songs, for example, yeah. I really don't like criticizing the performances of child actors. I mean, ultimately, I think we should probably just say no child actors ever like we know that it ruins so many child actors lives their childhoods to at the very least the childhood sometimes their entire lives for them to be child actors you know I, th I think you should have a fairly normal life and then when you become 18 you can pers like like then you can start doing acting in like but yeah you know I, I i tend to think that the the you know child actors who don't do all that well i i tend to place more blame on the people who made decisions that led to a child actor who is an incre who is not an incredible actor having a role that you know like the 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 parents, agent, director, whoever, you know, made those decisions, yeah, they should have either limited how much, like, like the director could maybe shoot around a, a, you know, childhood actor not delivering a good performance, for example, but anyway. I, I don't blame any child for being a bad actor, but I'm sorry. Other than Lilius Bell, most of the time when you see a child in this movie, they give a bad performance, and there are several bits where they do need to be giving a, a more convincing performance. And that's actually, that's, that's a... The... The child performances are very Sam Raimi, Spider-Man movie, kind of, you know, the, the, and it just doesn't work for the movie. And, and like, there are, there are multiple scenes where Diana will save children and then they'll like show the, the they'll share like a wink or a knowing look or something and we'll get like a shot of the child and it's just, it's not a good performance. And it completely takes you out of it. And again, I really, I don't, I don't like, I, I usually try to avoid criticizing child actors. And ult again, ultimately, I think they should have just cut around it instead of putting it front and center for, I mean, also, ultimately, it's not that many seconds, but it's still like, when you put something front and center, whether it's an acting performance or a you know, a special effect, when you put it front and center, it should hold up, it shouldn't immediately pull the audience out of the movie. So, the dialogue, there's a lot of, of exposition to be conveyed through it. There are several bits where, like, characterization and emotion is 
supposed to be conveyed and sometimes it does okay. The IMDb quote section has 22 entries. Eight of them are good, but 14 of them are bad. And 22, that's really not that much for as big of a movie seen by as many people as this is. Like, there are movies that have, you know, multiple times as many as that. So, yeah. So the cinematography, the DP was Matthew Jensen, who also DP'd the first one, and Fantastic and Chronicle. And Fantastic is a bad movie, but some of it is very well shot. And Chronicle is also very well shot. It is also a great movie. Now, let's see, things, there we go. So, quoting fellow critics here, its 80 specific color palette looks great with bold saturation. Director of photography Matthew Jensen's lenses lead to vibrant color contrasting with the dour shades of the first film. Director Patty Jenkins has a field day capturing the zeitgeist of 1980s America. From leg warmers to Cold War tension, oil embargoes to parachute pants, the movie loves to flash its 1980s cred, and it does so with bright and colorful visuals that really pop. Those colorful glimmers of 80s culture feel less historical than stuffed to nostalgic extremes. Jenkins splashes the screen with a colorful, bubbly, all-American look at our nation's capital in ways it never really was in the Reagan era, which is to say, looking not dissimilar to Back to the Future Part 2's living cartoon of 2015. Hyper bright colors helps that Jenkins has some much improved special effects at her disposal. Shin cinematographer Matthew Jensen have traded the first movie's somber World War One tone with vibrant colors and buoyant direction perhaps influenced by 80s blockbusters. Much like before, the film's cinematography is greatly utilized in the movie to enhance some of the more dramatic cinematic moments, which are all again provided by Matthew Jensen, oh, my back, my neck, who worked on the first Wonder Woman movie. All of the other aspects were pretty much spot on, so even though the film has problems throughout, the production presentation for Wonder Woman 1984 is what I would expect from a superhero movie. I think I'm going to have to rush through some of this to, yeah, um, okay, and the, the editing was handled by Richard Pearson, who edited some Godzilla Kong Muppet stuff that I'm not familiar with, and Justice League, I mean, I'm sure he was, and Iron Man too. hmm, Men in Black 2, scary movie too. But he did also edit Born Supremacy. Yeah. But yeah, you know, clearly changed a lot in editing with hasty reshoots for the worse. Yeah, so this is a comment from a comment from a critic. Yeah, a critic's site. Producers and directors need some self-restraint and discipline. This movie was like they never bothered to make a second, third, or fourth tighter cut of it, and went on and released the first assembly. I'm not 100% certain if that is the case, but I agree it does. It does somewhat feel like that. Yeah. The special effects, like, I forget exactly who it was who said it, but someone said straight up, they're just, they're not finished. The, you know, so of course they look bad. Some of the effects are good, but yeah, for sure, some of them are really, really bad. And the, the movie makes some...
yeah, move, moving on. Some of the stunts are are good, and the one of the problems is that the sometimes you know Wonder Woman will be like running out in the open and it looks like they filmed her running in front of a green screen so that they could later just put it in the you know plop her into the the background that they wanted to use and it's just extremely obvious like it really draws attention to itself So, Patty Jenkins said that if Diana doesn't use her shoulder shield in this, I'm not going to give away whether she does or not, it's because she doesn't want to kill any humans, which makes sense. In the first one, she brought the sword and shield to kill Ares. Now, and, and there's at least one action scene where she goes out of her way to protect people during a fight. Others have already pointed out there's too little action, especially fighting involving Diana and or her in Wonder Woman garb. There's too long stretches without any action. The climax has too little of Wonder Woman fighting. The lasso is used way too much and basically just... Yeah, I already mentioned it can do anything that the writers want it to, which makes, you know... The, that means you can never you're you're never really that impressed by what it can do because it just feels it feels unearned because it's so inconsistent if you can ignore the negatives of the action some of it is definitely fun to watch i'm not saying you should ignore all the negatives but that is at least something like there are some action movies where you cannot enjoy the action like there's there's a lot of action in the movie Resident Evil I don't remember what it's called the fifth one the fifth Resident Evil movie has significant chunks of action where no matter how much you just turn your brain off it's just not fun to watch and it didn't even it doesn't even look like it was particularly fun to do Now, let's see the... None of the action is as good as the action in the first movie. Way too much talking instead of action. It's boring. Several action scenes should, could have been cut with no impact on plot. And, yeah, so we have chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles, use of superpowers I mean some of the ideas are kind of cool I already mentioned the Olympics then there's this bit in the I could talk a little bit more about the mall you know there's some robbers and they're trying to flee and Wonder Woman comes in and you know works to stop them I'm not gonna say how well it goes or not but you know a mall that is the you know an American mall that's the 1980s defined and yeah there's a uh, I guess yeah I, I feel like going briefly into so spoilers there's a bit in the White House and there's a bit on this open road in one of the Middle Eastern countries I'm not 100% certain which and yeah you know they're they're decent setups and ideas you know we haven't it's not stuff we've seen a million times before no more spoilers for the time being so the music and score was handled by Hans Zimmer and yeah I don't need to get into you you know Hans Zimmer we all know Hans Zimmer he he did a perfectly fine job I'm not sure that I would say it's like 
absolutely incredible. I don't think it's his best work, but I do think that some of it is very effective and compelling. Now, let's see. The... That brings us to the tone. The first movie takes some inspiration from Superman 1978, and this one, some from Superman 2. And, yeah, you know, the movie is a cartoon, a comic book, except when it isn't, and the tonal dissonance is a problem. Now, let's see. I don't think it's a problem for the movie that some scenes are campy. I think it's a problem that other scenes are trying to be harsh and gritty. The tonal dissonance is a problem. And yeah, so the movie is two hours and thirty one minutes. You know, if you if you count the end credits and two hours and twenty six minutes long, if you don't count them, and again, you you know the the. Yeah, there's there's one mid credit scene, but there's no post credits. You don't have to send, sit through all of the end credits. And yeah, I can't really claim that it's worth the investment of time. I think if you if you aren't interested, thirty minutes in, yeah, I'm not sure. I would say the movie really is going to get. You know, you've already seen the movie deliver some of the best parts. The movie feels longer than it is, which, no, really, even though it's 2 hours and 26 minutes, it feels even longer. I'm not sure it really makes sense to, like, fast forward through. There's not that many scenes that you can fast forward through without missing something important. Now, there is some Islamophobia in the movie, and it could easily have been avoided. You could so easily rewrite those parts of the movie so that it wouldn't offend any, any Muslim, any Muslim country. You know, the, the movie makes some, com some comments on Muslims that are very ignorant, and it's especially just, it is unacceptable for a movie made while Trump was president that is critical of him as president to be this Islamophobic. And, like, considering Gadot is in favor of apartheid, the abuse of Palestinians, the Islamophobia is ultimately unsurprising, but it is still a problem. And it's weird because so much of the movie is progressive. Now, ultimately, if you, if, if it works for you, which ultimately I can't guarantee, but then some of the joy of Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman doing her thing and you know, every so often saying something that's just incredibly meaningful. You know, I already mentioned the one with my life hasn't been what you probably think it has. We all have our struggles. You know, the... Everyone who idolizes someone else needs to hear that from the person they idolize. That is... And, and it's, you know, the, the level of emotional intelligence it takes to write not only a line like that, but a scene where someone tells their, their fan that, you know, clearly, 
like Patty Jenkins has incredible talent. I don't know if maybe maybe the maybe maybe the the I don't think I, based on this movie I don't think that she is yet capable of crafting of completely coherent plot of like a big blockbuster you know the the if you watch monster i know some people say you know not enough plot but i mean i already made i i made a case for that in the the long video i made about monster so i'm not going to repeat that here but that movie there is a clear like you understand why the different things that happen in the movie happen and that's just not always the case here and maybe you know I, I do think a chunk of that issue has to do with she she shot it but the movie ended up too long or producers worried that some people would take issue with it or something or other you know the I mean she ended up managing to get a lot of this stuff that's stereotypically associated with women you know loving loving shoes for example into the movie I don't know maybe there's like 10 other things she wanted in the movie but the producers eventually managed to get her to cut and in cutting those elements out she ultimately had to cut entire scenes that had bits that helped explain why this is you know the the it's difficult to know when you're making a movie exactly how long the final movie is going to be and sometimes it does end up much longer than you thought and some of the best movies ever made were originally way too long and it took talented editors a lot of time to trim them down to where they're no longer unwieldy but still do make sense like they didn't remove too much and yeah so the worst aspect um i think i would have to say that the single worst aspect of the movie is just how the the overall moral of the movie how offensive it is and how badly the movie like kind of mangles the the like there are times where it seems like the movie thinks that it's making a a strong case for its moral but really it's proving that it's moral that they didn't think it through completely and I do think that it's a big problem for the movie. Now, let's see. And others have said the worst thing is how cheesy it is, how much of, like, how much 80s stuff is in there, and I can understand their issue. I don't think it's a huge problem for the movie. I was probably most worried that Steve Trevor returning wouldn't undermine the power of his sacrifice at the end of the first movie, and ultimately it doesn't really, but it's not a good thing either. Like, it, they wanted him back, you know? Gal Gadot and uh, Chris Pine have unbelievable chemistry together. Of, of course they wanted him back. I'm sure Patty Jenkins loved working with him. He's talented and charming. But you killed off the character, you know, and I, I get it. I get what they were trying to do here. I just don't think it worked. And... The thing I was most looking forward to was Wonder Woman being an inspiration. And I would say overall, 
the movie did meet my expectations. It, it didn't exceed them, but it did meet them overall. Parts of the movie are entertaining to watch. I'm not sure that I would say that the movie as a whole is entertaining to watch. The trailers give too much away. I, I found that there's like two trailers that are both around 2 minutes and 22, 23 seconds. And yeah. They, they do give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you don't like the trailer. The cover and poster do not give too much away. They help, they give a decent indication of whether or not you'll like, you know, if you like the poster or cover, you're more likely to like the movie than if not. So, let's see. The... So I have a list of big problems with the movie that I can only detail by going into spoilers. So I will do so in the notes taken before watching section. Now, when I looked on YouTube, there's a pretty substantial amount of YouTube videos, maybe seven hours or something. And... Most of them are quite good. There are a number that do a good job explaining the problems with the movie. And the videos by Filmento, The Closer Look, and Nando V Movies also feature suggestions for rewrites that would greatly improve the movie. And I definitely recommend, although the Nando V Movies one, because there's so many problems with this movie that so much of a rewrite is necessary, I think it's like an hour and two minutes. And I, I think his usual video is like 10 to 20 minutes. You know, and it's... Usually, the, the other videos I've seen by him are called the one change or the one fix or something. But for this one, he had to go back and rewrite a lot of the movie to, to make it work well. So the movie has 59% on the tomato meter based on 430 reviews and 73% audience score based on over... 2,500 verified ratings, and the critics' consensus is Wonder Woman 1984 struggles with sequel overload, but still offers enough vibrant escapism to satisfy fans of the franchise and its classic central character. But yeah, of the 433 reviews, 256 are fresh and 177 are rotten. Now, but yeah, you know, 59%, that means that it is rotten. Um, I I feel like, is 60 the cut off? So, something like that. 61, maybe. And on Metacritic, it has a rating of, what does that say, 60? And based on 57 critic reviews, and the user rating of 3.3 wow based on 200 uh, sorry 2369 ratings and 858 user reviews on IMDb it has a 5.4 out of 10 with 7173 IMDb user reviews wow i thought birds of prey ticked people off. That one has like 2,000 something. So this one has more than three times as much, as many. And 400 reviews on IMDb's external reviews section. And yeah, so 19% gave it a 6, 17% gave it a 5, 13% gave it a 7, 10% gave it a 4, and almost 10% gave it a 1. 9.8% gave it a 1. 5.6% gave it a 2. 76 gave it a 3. Yeah. And... Yeah, so the movie does not have a lot of 
violence or other material like the there's some there's some dark themes and such but it doesn't really have a lot of violence like bloody violence that kind of violence there's fighting but yeah but yeah this is cinematic junk food and Yeah, I'm just really quickly going to quote a fellow critic here. Themes of truth prevailing over greed and the dangers of seeking excess are so obvious and juvenile that it makes you wonder how Jenkins still falls face first into the pratfall of her own critique. Now, that brings us, I copied in a lot of reviews, but I'm skimming through gradually. Okay, here we go. I recommend this to big fans of Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot, but for, yeah, for most people, it's, it's hard to, to recommend, yeah. Now the the Blu-ray has one hour, thirty-four minutes, twenty-five seconds of pretty good special feature stuff. You know, there's behind the scenes interviews with actors and film crew. They go into the stunts, effects, writing of among others, the opening on Themyscira, the mall, the White House scenes, open road, Diana and Barbara, etc. There's a gag reel. It's it's good stuff. I, w I would say the best the the uh, I I already mentioned I don't feel like I wasted money here, but I definitely would say that the the best part of the Blu-ray is the the special features, not the movie. Now. Nah. I rate this four misguided sequels out of ten, and yeah, I, th I think I've pretty much made clear what my my issues are with it. And that brings us to the next section: thoughts section. Start disclaimers. Spoilers from here on out for this movie. I will still be warning for spoilers about anything other than this movie and the DCEU movies that came before it. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it's very standard information. I'm not really speaking I'm not gonna keep speaking as fast as sometimes during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So, this is where I get into, am I glad that this is a sequel, a kind, kind of prequel to BVS and, and Justice League? Not especially, I, I really wish the movie had just something that you could point to and say, there's a, you know, you watch this, because it'll matter for later movies, but like, <laughs> it doesn't help. Like, I'm mean, yeah, I'm not gonna spoil Black Widow in this the the solo movie in this video, but I would say that it makes sense to watch that. I I would I would argue that it adds it it makes it's you know. It adds to our understanding of Natasha Romanoff. 
And I'm not sure I would say that this movie really does do that. Like, she misses Steve. I knew that before this movie, you know? Like, say what you will about Justice League, and heh, it's a bad movie, but at least it does have something with Diana that you did. Like, hypothetically, if you skipped Justice League, if you didn't watch that, you know, the original cut, I don't know if it stayed in the Snyder cut. If you don't watch Justice League, you know, you you missed, like, Diana trying to come to terms with, you know, yeah, not being a hero for, you know, yeah, supposedly for a hundred years because she missed Steve Trevor. But this movie, like, there isn't really... I'm not going to talk about the, the retcons. You know, obviously it makes even less sense when, th you know, this movie shows that she was a hero at least sometime during the those hundred years. She did get Steve back at least temporarily. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to go off on a thing about that. But no, I, I can't really point to anything in this movie. Without, I hope, I hope that, that, that Cheetah comes back and, you know, maybe that will help, you know, retroactively make this movie more. But, like, at the start of the movie, Diana is willing to to wait to make a wish on the Dreamstone, which everyone thinks, you know, I, th I think it was, yeah, no Nostalgia Critic called it the, the wish stone when he did, like, voiceover for some of the plot summary for his yeah for the nostalgic critic video on this movie but he like the the yeah what's the word uh let me think and yeah and then had to correct it that it's the it's not the wish stone it's the dream stone but i mean i don't know why they didn't just call it the wish stone but anyway Like, yeah, and by the end of the movie, she accepts that she can't have him back, but it just, like, it just doesn't feel like the, the, yeah, I, I think, let's, um, that I had to say. The rest of this video is not a review. This is a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MST3K, riff tracks, and other jokes. Time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts I have while watching, in chronological order. If you think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, and the like, the section after that is thoughts I had before watching. The movie has empathy for even the least likable characters, and I do think that was the the right choice. Now, let's see. That is it for this section. Notes taken while watching. They do a good job of making clear who's winning in the opening race, something that is sometimes an issue for scenes like this. You know, the arrow hitting the color, which is coded specifically to the partici participants, does a really good job and also functions as why they can tell that Diana must have cheated. And that's also the answer to all those people who said you know, that she didn't cheat. She was just being creative. I, I, I'm not a big sports person. I personally think that it's more interesting for pre creative stuff than for, you know, really, for, for rules that really hamper. But, I mean, 
those are the rules you know like you can petition to change the rules you can strike you can you can argue but when you're in the competition you can't just break the rules and say i don't like the rules i you know what you can do that as a as a form of protest sure but you can't then expect that to be treated as if you follow the rules i've always said rules are meant not to be broken but to be understood and then broken if they don't make sense to follow i mean it sucks it wasn't her you know you, you get why it happened she was she was eager to she, you know she was really happy that she was in the lead and she she looked back and they were far behind her and then she got knocked off you know because she didn't look where she was going but you know it's not like somebody else like tripped her horse or something you know but yeah you know clearly part of the competition is you have to fire arrows at all of the colored markers if you don't that means you didn't qualify as actually getting that far like you don't have to like these rules but the movie does make them quite clear at this point i have to wonder if every single wonder woman solo movie is going to open with Diana taking part in some kind of competition on Themyscira and doing well but something goes wrong before she wins. For those who watch this without the subtitles for the hard of hearing, you might miss that one of the criminals, pretty sure you can guess which one, is named Buzzcut. Another one's called Flattop. I really appreciate that the movie puts appropriate emphasis on the robber who grabs the little girl and tries to use ah what's the word use her as like a shield to you know to get away without being arrested entirely too many of these movies treat that kind of thing way too casually like i knew that she wasn't going to get hurt that wonder woman would show up and save the day but the filming editing and acting communicated to me this might actually you know he might actually drop her she might actually get seriously injured or worse, you know, and yeah, I, like way too many of these movies just have civilians in danger as kind of background. I'm not sure I would really say that I think it works in the movie, but I do appreciate that Wonder Woman is clearly attempting to maintain these children's innocence when she saves them, which again, way too many movies just shrug off the trauma done to the victims since they're just there to show that the hero saves people, but she doesn't only save these two girls. One of them she drops off on, I don't know what it's called in English. It's, you know, one of those electronic horse things where if you put in the right coin, it'll, like, move back and forth for a while, and the kid, you know, sitting on it can enjoy that. The other kid she sends sliding off into a large stuffed animal, and then she winks at her, the kid winks back, you know. She's clearly... It's important to her that their childhood isn't ruined because of this, you know. I can't fi figure out if the bit with the guy wishing for coffee and then getting it is the movie making fun of how silly the wishing... Yeah, I'm going to call it the wishing stone. The concept is like having some self-awareness or if it's supposed to be what demonstrates to Barbara and Diana how it works and that it works... Barbara giving food to the homeless man is really sweet. I just wish the movie wasn't confused when it comes to this aspect later in the movie. I mean, just, just briefly, obviously it's wrong how much she beats up the guy. But, and, and you know, when, when it comes to the homeless man, she just says, mind your business. I kind of feel like, I mean, I guess maybe, yeah, maybe they thought that would be going too far, but she should have been either, yeah, like, like if she said something worse to him, which I can't help but wonder if it, if she did and it got edited out because when he walks up and he's like, Barbara, what are you doing? He's very clearly holding, like, I want to say it's like a, maybe a thermos and like some some food 
And then it cuts to her. I, I forget if that's when she delivers her line or if it's the next, or if it cuts back to him before, before she delivers her line. But she, he's then standing and he's holding nothing. And I, I figure there was probably a short, just a few seconds where he put what he was holding down and said something and they trimmed that out of the movie and just hoped we wouldn't notice the continuity gaff. But yeah, like I, like she says, mind your business or something like that to him. But, and I guess that's supposed to show that she no longer has the the warmth and humanity that she used to where she used to give him food but i don't know it's just i agree that she shouldn't do that it just feels to me more like oh she she snapped a little like like that's the kind of thing that like you know if you're if you're impatient and someone tells you you know oh you shouldn't have done that you might be like Get off my back about it. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know, I, f I feel like, I don't know, maybe this is going too far, but just thinking out loud here, maybe if she, like, got angry at him, like, s s smacked food out of his hand, and it ended up on the ground, like, inedible or something, then we have a really strong contrast. You know, when she's good, she's giving him food, and she made sure to get there while he was still hot. When she's bad, she's, you know, taking away the food he has. You know, so, something like that. Just saying, mind your business, that's not... I, I don't think it's enough, at least. And, yeah. And now I've made my case for it, so I'm going to move on. It is sweet that Diana risks giving away her secret identity to help Barbara against the guy. But then when she talks to Barbara right, at, Barbara right after, I get serious RoboCop 1 vibes. You know, the bit where... He saves a woman, and then immediately after, he tells her to go seek counseling. You know, it's it's the satire of how bad police are at comforting survivors. But yeah, it's like you know, she she helps, and then she's like, "Just go home, okay?" Just I I don't know what that was about. So I've seen some say that the only reason Barbara eventually becomes a, a cheetah is that she liked that Diana wore leopard print on her shoes once I think she just in general you know she likes cheetahs she has a stuffed I don't know cheetah cub it, it based on the size it looks like a house cat there's no way it's a house cat who would stuff a house cat I don't know I guess hypothetically if it died or something but then it what kind of a house cat looks that much like a cheetah I, I don't know but anyway I believe that her her office you know she she walks in and the camera pans and we see that there's this stuffed I'm gonna go with cheetah cub on a uh, um, shelf in her office so I'm pretty sure the idea is just supposed to be she in general thinks cheetahs are kind of cool and she, you know, that's why she likes it on Diana. And, you know, in addition to that, then you have this, I don't know if it's, I believe the, the person who said that that's why was a male movie critic, so maybe he didn't really, I, I think it might have just been an excuse to have a close-up of, you know, the shoes to, like, say, you know, I think it might actually just be, like, you know, maybe Patty Jenkins did think those were nice shoes. She wanted to share them. It, you know, not everything has to be, like, set up for something later. It can just be, like, I mean, come on. How many male gaze scenes do we have where it's like, oh, check out, the, you know, this female body part. Or look at this woman doing exercise or something like that, you know. I really don't think there's anything wrong with women making movies where there are more close-ups of shoes or discussion of clothes or whatever. If that's what they want to put in there, I, I, anyway. It's a good detail that Maxwell makes sure that the entrance to his building is fancy, but when you go further up, it isn't convincing anymore because a lot of people that he talks to aren't going to see the, you know, 
they're gonna, he's gonna meet them in the lobby and they're gonna make an appointment to have lunch in an expensive place or something and they'll never go and actually see how unfinished his office is that uh, it was a decent like the the kid is you know he's like oh you know rome wasn't built in a day and then i was sort of like hasn't it been a lot of days by now <laughs> that's a decent kind of yeah now i've seen some people say that at the end of the movie when diana can't make it through a little bit of wind it doesn't make sense because she's moved through more powerful forces early in the movie but granting wishes like it's supposed to be this godlike force of the stone the you know wh whenever it grants a single wish there's this small you know burst whoosh of wind so there at the end when he's granting like millions of wishes all at once yeah the the wind you know you can make an argument that they should have had in stronger industrial fans when they shot the scene but the logic is sound I'm not sure that I would say that it works, but I do appreciate that the movie attempts to give some background to the villains. And, you know, the, the, let's see. Yeah, you know, Barbara and Max both get, you know, you, you understand why they do what they do they they have reasons for being the way that they are it's not just like randomly it doesn't it doesn't come completely out of nowhere you know ba basically the yeah both of them behave the way they do because of the way others treat them others look at them you know there there is there's a there's a element of a good critique of you know I mean basically th these are not these are not evil people but they are wounded they you know the the movie makes the case that we need to treat everyone with decency you know but then that is sadly also kind of like we know that you know it's it's not you you need to um you need to have more to say about it than just we need to treat other people better now when cheetah enters the party the lyrics to the song go the jungle call the jungle call so that's a, a quite good yeah i don't mind that the movie brings up that a lot of men harass women including ones not thought of as traditionally attractive like you know barbara was assaulted by a drunk guy right after she got hot food to the homeless man you know at that point we're not supposed to think of her as attractive we're we think of her as kind of awkward and such but she was still sexually assaulted you know the the like a lot of people say well you know if women don't dress pretty then they don't get sexually assaulted First of all, that's not true. Second of all, when women dress down, then that's what they get comments about. Then guys start saying, why don't you dress prettier? Besides which they shouldn't have to. You know, I... Yeah, I, I don't think that it's wrong to bring it up. I do think the fact that the movie doesn't... Like... It doesn't bring up a solution. It doesn't really address that men need to be taught not to do that. It makes the movie weaker than it could be. But I suppose it's possible that Gal Gadot and Patty Jenkins did include something like that. But then the producers forced them to remove it in post-production. And it's one of the many things that leave the movie feeling awkwardly put together. You know, ultimately, like, hypothetically, if you completely removed every instance of a man assaulting a woman or catcalling her or anything the movie wouldn't really change like you could easily have that have have the drunk guy the drunk businessman guy you could easily have him do something else you know like i mean wouldn't the the kind of the stereotypical thing if if it was a male 
if you know comic book hero it would probably be a mugger you know you, you could change it to a mugger and it wouldn't really you know it wouldn't make a huge difference because at the end of the day it's not that much of a theme it's not like she's now going around like early in the movie she's basically ignored but then also sometimes sexually assaulted and then later in the movie she still gets sexually assaulted but now she beats up the guy who sexually assaults her and now she gets cat called like if if she doesn't like like she clearly likes at least some of the attention the movie's kind of confused on this i don't i'm not saying there's a problem with a woman liking getting attention like that but not liking getting you know but other times not liking the attention or it's just that it seems like she does like most of the attention like she you know basically the i i can't, i don't think there's a single other instance in the entire movie from from when she wishes to be like diana for the entire rest of the movie the only time where she doesn't like them where she like clearly expresses not liking the male attention like occasionally maybe she doesn't maybe she doesn't like getting catcalled as she's running down the street but she doesn't really react to it like she doesn't she could easily beat him up if that was what she wanted or you know tell him not to or something but then yeah it doesn't really and and Max was one of the people treating her badly. Max saw her, saw that she was awkward and a fan of his, and figured, I can manipulate her. And so he did. And I mean, she must have realized ev eventually, right? He he gets the stone from her, and she's like apologetic to, to Diana. And then later she still works with him, and it's just like, Maybe maybe it is in there. Maybe one of the scenes that the two talk together, she tells him, don't you ever talk to a woman the way you talk to me. Never manipulate a woman like that again, or I'll kick your ass or something, you know. And he's like, fair enough. Deal. And then the scene moves on, but they had to remove it for just... You know, not, not every movie has to address the same things but if you just the movie brings it up and then doesn't really do anything with it you know like after she beats up the guy does it even get brought up again i think that might be the last time that a woman is cat called yeah it's just like and and when she like she takes advantage of you know, she she finds this guy who knows some some stuff and gets his help, and then she just walks away. And he's like, "But I I helped you. I thought you you know." He's like, "I th I thought there was more." And I mean, maybe that's supposed to be like shoes on the other foot. Like that's what a lot of men do to women, and and so they're saying you know men wouldn't like it if women did it to them, but. Does that mean that she's as bad now as m men are normally? I just it it does it seems confused and and it's it's really it's too bad. You know the the like suddenly I can't quite remember. No, the, yeah, the movie Birds of Prey, I'm pretty sure had come out by the time this movie did. Wasn't it like a 2019 movie? Or was it 2020? Uh, I mean, I feel like that movie... Yeah, I'm just, I'm really quickly going to look it up. Because I don't really want to spoil if it, okay, so. 
Yeah, it's his 2020 film. And let's see the Let's see. Yeah, so February of 2020. Okay, and this movie. In the places that it did come out, it came out December. So, yeah. Birds of Prey does paint most of the men as treating women badly. And I mean, I would say basically by the end of the movie, that movie basically says, you know, if, if the men around you, you know, if you as a woman experience that the men around you treat you badly, find other women to... To, you know, to work with, to drink with, to have fun with. Don't settle for being around men who treat you badly, you know. But this movie, I mean, at the end of the movie, Diana and Barbara aren't friends anymore, I don't think. We don't really see them, you know, we don't, we don't see them say or say anything to each other after the wishes have been renounced and all, but then, I mean, I mean that kind of tells me that they must not be friends anymore, because if they were, I'm sure the movie would make sure to say, to, to clarify that, so, I guess, yeah, I, I guess if, if the men around you are bad, you gotta be alone? Is, is that what we're supposed to take from the movie? Because that's what ends up happening. You know, clearly Barbara shouldn't spend more time with Max. So she's alone again. And, and she's no longer friends with Diana because... And that's also the... She wanted to be treated better and it ends up ruining her relationship with Diana. Like, the... I, yeah, the, the movie is kind of confused on, on this. Anyway. It is legitimately sweet when Diana and Steve are reunited. I just wish that the movie addressed the how messed up it is that he's using another man's body. And honestly, I can imagine there's probably some cut material, some deleted scenes where they do go into it. I let him borrow it. What? Why? Where? When? Which? How? And Diana points out they can't get Steve on a plane because he doesn't have a passport, which is true. If you don't have a legal name, you cannot have a passport. And according to the cast list, the man whose body Steve is possessing is just credited as handsome man. So, yeah, he can't get a passport off that. No, I'm, I'm not over how messed up it is that they're borrowing his body putting it in danger, you know, effectively raping him when when they have sex, and 100% certain they have sex, so, yeah. So a number of people have pointed out the various problems with Steve flying the plane at the Smithsonian, and I don't really disagree, but what, you know, I do think it is kind of sweet that, like, right after Diana hears Steve say that he wants to fly this much more advanced plane than he's used to flying, she takes him to fly a plane, you know, that is legitimately a, a sweet, you know, I, I, let's see, I don't know what the alternative would be, I'll grant that, they did have to travel far in a short space of time, I don't know, maybe the, the, yeah, because this is before she learns that, before, before she can, you know, use the lasso on, um, lightning, uh, yeah, li lightning bolts and clouds and such. 
I don't know, I guess a train tick yeah, that would also be difficult. Yeah, I mean I guess Yeah, I'm I'm not sure exactly what else, but <clears throat> still, you know. We when we see them in bed together, you know, clearly that's you know, like I think the term is honeymoon phase, you know, the the they're still like deeply in love with each other and really want to make each other happy, want to spend all their time together. And yeah, she she lets him fly a plane, you know, it's yeah. And Steve is just like clicking various buttons in the cockpit, just kinda like trying to figure out, you know, I just want Diane, you know, for him to like flip one of them for Diana to immediately flip back. We need that to live. I mean, one of the problems is that there's just so much wish fulfillment going on. I think that they just did a little and then they came up with good just justification or something. But we just have scene after scene of wish fulfillment. I mean, I guess the payoff is supposed to be the ending when everyone renounces their wish. But that feels extremely condescending. It doesn't feel like a, like a satisfying payoff. You know, when Minerva starts acting like a predatory animal, like her voice and eyes, she really does exude that kind of power and attitude. I might have said that earlier in the video as well. I mean, I feel like the scene where she beats up the harasser does get across that she's taking it too far. She keeps hitting him repeatedly. And that brings us to the open road action scene. I don't have a problem with Diana getting into the Wonder Woman suit really quickly, but... I do think that the movie needed some kind of thing, like, maybe if she runs and then, like, yeah, let's say she, she runs really fast and then she, like, dives forward and spins in the air. And as she's spinning, her clothes become the Wonder Woman suit. Something. As it is, like, they cut from a shot where she's just wearing the, the actual costume for the, the scene that isn't the Wonder Woman outfit. Then it cuts to something else, cuts back, and suddenly, I, I forget, I think it's the, maybe the crown, or maybe you see, like, the, um, maybe you see it, some of the Wonder Woman suit through her clothes. I, I forget exactly what it is, but just, you know, yeah, it would have been fine if they made it look like she was always wearing it under her clothes. You know, like, in the first one, she was wearing at least some of the uniform under her clothes at least some of the movie, so when she, you know, at the no man's land, you know, when she goes up there, you know, yeah, she, she and that worked, but here it just, yeah. When Diana's under the car, some of the wheels get messed up from the shooting, I'm gonna have to retire them. Steve tries to fight the guys in the tank, one of them, like, pulls him into the tank. I don't mind if they want to do some comedy bits with this character, but I mean, he was a trained soldier who, like, the man knows how to fight. It's, you know, it's not like he's dealing with some kind of technology that he wasn't used to when he was, you know, they had tanks. They had tanks in the first movie. So just, yeah. Or am I thinking of no, no, she, she like, she throws a tank when, when Dr. Poisonous is right there, so, yeah. Their civilizations collapsed catastrophically with no clue as to why. Stakes raised. I mean, I appreciate, at least they try to give Steve something to do, you know, he helps fight a couple of times. He's the one who points out the monkey's paw thing, he flies the plane. But, yeah, you know, like, the there are parts of the movie where he doesn't really, he's just kind of being dragged along. In the White House, I do appreciate that Diana goes out of her way to protect the guards that Barbara attacks. I think it could have been better, but I do appreciate that. Uh, what did I say? Barbara and Diana do talk about, you know, the power of Diana isn't just trying to knock her out. Barbara does, you know, unfortunately, Barbara perceives it as Diana, like, 
condescending to her. Maybe she saw the Imagine video. But the... Yeah, you know, because Barbara feels like nobody thinks she's good enough. Yeah. You know, if they have the psychological aspect there, a lot of fights like this do just boil down to people hitting each other in a way that the filmmakers thought would look cool. After the White House, when Diana and Steve walk through the chaotic crowd, it is legitimately fairly affecting. Like, you do get the sense that if things keep going like this, civilization will end. Just like for the other, you know, Wishing Stone users. I do appreciate that the goodbye between Diana and Steve, you know, I appreciate what it's trying to do. I just don't think it quite works. And Wonder Woman flies in in Asterius armor, knocks out the military men in the outer defense of the base. Two of them land in the water. Wait, is that the water that Diana electrifies to stop Barbara? Do they survive that? So the reason that Cheetah can get through the wings of the exterior armor with Asteria armor with ease is that she is more physically strong than the armies of man from Asteria's time. I don't personally think it's a huge problem, but it does ultimately kind of feel like <laughs> like they wanted her to get rid of the wings, you know. They 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 either didn't think it would be good for her to be running around with the wings or maybe they felt that you know, yeah, maybe it was unwieldy or something and they were like well why would she just drop the wings so they have to figure out something to also because like she never actually like when the wings are gone and and barbara could like hypothetically like she doesn't manage to do like anything to actually hurt diana herself she just tears through the the you know, and I, I, you know, some people said it looked like tinfoil. I mean, we did see how strong it was earlier in the movie. But, yeah, it's just, it, it's awkward because it's like they just needed to get her, the wings off her. And they wanted to show that Cheetah was super strong. But there's no good reason why you can't, like... It just, yeah, it, it it feels really awkward. I feel like it would have, like she was being shot at. Why not just have some of the, the, and actually, yeah, it's probably specifically supposed to be, well, she can be shot at and still have the wings be fine. But Cheetah, she's that strong. But then why doesn't Cheetah manage to, like, do any other she doesn't manage to actually injure diana at all so just yeah way too short of a fight between diana and barbara here at the end it's supposed to be the climax of a huge blockbuster movie and the movie has built to a final confrontation between the two of them you know the climax of the first movie the bit with aries and diana fighting is basically my one true problem with the first wonder woman movie but at least it's less anticlimactic than this I don't know what the movie is trying to do here at the end, showing Maxwell's background. They had already been humanizing him. We saw how much he cared about his son, Alistair. I've seen a number of people think that Barbara must have renounced her wish off screen. And if you... Uh, see, and, and I've seen a few suggest that we don't actually know if she did renounce it or if the effects stopped in which case she could hypothetically become cheetah again down the line considering her performance i would like her to return in the third movie that they are apparently making as long as they the writing for her character is just better and i think it is very intentional that we we don't see her renounce it but we do see that she survived that entire thing 
and she's no longer Cheetah at the end. So, you know, I mean, uh, Max himself renounces his wish to become the Dreamstone. That should, hypothetically, undo all the other wishes. So, now, it is sweet that Alistair already loves Maxwell, but it does also make so much of the movie feel completely pointless. That was the only reason he was doing it. It should feel... I, f I feel like it should have been that he did actually have a problem and he found another way to solve it instead of just, he was wrong. There wasn't a problem there at all. Because that, the that was the whole point. Like, he wanted to prove to his son that he was worth being proud of. <sighs> yeah, it's just... I don't hate the mid credits scene of Asteria, although I guess I can understand why others do. I think it must have been amazing if you're, you know, if you grew up on the, the 1977 Linda Carter Wonder Woman show to see her. I, I think it's super cool that they have her do, she does the spin, you know, she, she only does it once, but that's, that's the spin. That's the Wonder Woman spin. You know, if you go, if, yeah, you're already on YouTube if you're watching this, there are plenty of videos of Linda Carter doing the Wonder Woman spin and you'll see it's it's the except that that was very nicely done and and you know she has she carries herself like Diana like like Gal Gadot's Diana does you know she's oh don't you know don't worry about it it was it's it's no big deal I've been doing this for a while and you know it comes with the territory and all these you know just yeah I don't know, I, I liked it. I And I do hope we get to see more the... I, c I could definitely see her as, as like, uh, having a lot of screen time in, in a third movie. That would be, that would be really cool. There's a, there's a lot of things they can do that. Because she was an Amazon, so that would mean that Diana had another Amazon to talk to. And I think a connection to her home is one of the, the biggest... Like, that that would be much more compelling, I think, than just a romantic interest, you know. I, I like Chris Pine. I will never, I will never criticize having Pine in a movie, but, you know, they already, they did the love story between them already. I, th I think it would have been... Yeah, like, if, if they're gonna have this thing of, like, oh, she makes a wish, and someone that she knows she can't have back well if it were another amazon maybe even maybe what if what if it was specifically like her mother and her mother was like diana i want to help you but my people need their leader i can't abandon them at a time like this and diana's like but i've missed you for so many years you know and and i, th I think that would be a lot more compelling uh, than, than just having the but I get it, Chris Pine, like, he seems like just the nicest guy. Like, you watch the, like, interviews and blooper reel and such, it's just, he seems like the nicest guy. And clearly, like, he and, and Gal Gadot really enjoy, that. like, when you watch Gag, like, he cracks her up, like, so regularly that, like, there are times where she's like, he's doing it. Do you see? He's doing it. He's doing it. He's making me crack up right now, and it means we blow the take. And and you know, there's time. And he's like, I didn't do anything. It's just, just they're they're so cute together. Just yeah, you know the the. I get it. I just I I think it would be, but but yeah, with Asteria, they have a great, you know, yeah. There's there's. I hope they make her a major part of the third movie and focus on Diana being away from her home. And like, maybe there could be some things where, where a serious, like, don't you, don't you do this anymore? And she's like, Oh no, no, we, we don't really do that in, in the world of man. And it's there is like, but there was a reason that you did it. Don't you miss it? You know, stuff, stuff like that, I think could be a, a compelling kind of, I mean, if they're going to keep, they could do a completely different thing. That would be fine. I'm just saying so far, you know, we've now done... Patty Jenkins has directed two Gal Gadot-led Wonder Woman solo movies. 
and in both of them there is this like yeah so so far in both of them it's 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 Diana and Steve talking about how the world is compared to what they're used to and if it's better or worse and all these things they don't have to do that for a third but if they're going to I think it would be compelling if it was with Asteria and comparing because that is like you know people change when they move away from the people that they grew up with and they start meeting new people they change and sometimes it's for the better sometimes it's for the worse and I think if if that is the if they if they continue to do that thing I think it would be an interesting way to go that brings us to the final section entitled note taken before watching and I am just gonna skim through a bunch of stuff that I copied in here but probably should have copied out of here okay here we go so the nostalgia critic refers to yeah I already mentioned you know the the three characters that Barbara Minerva is reminiscent of so nostalgia critic consist consistently refers to as Electronigma Kyle, which is perfectly nailed it. And let's see. Yeah, so I, I already talked about this. I'm just gonna the last couple of words on that. My life hasn't been what you think it has. We all have struggles. Great line, no self no self-pity, empathy, insight. And I liked the, you know, Wonder Woman throws the, the crown as a sort of Wonder Woman themed battering. And let's see. Yeah, when, when the trailer came out, I theorized, you know, is it a clone or shapeshifter or something? Now, let's see. And yeah, the 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 trailer shows Steve walking out with like a fanny pack. Is that an '80s thing? I thought it was a '90s thing. I mean, I for sure had one of those back in 1990. Never. Yeah, I know. But if you're going to steal, steal from Deadpool. Now, let's see. So, yeah, the... I don't mind that they made Steve the fish out of water. I just feel like... Like, it was, it was kind of weird how... You know, the, the two of them meet and, and there's like, well, we have a very clear mission. And then instead of proceeding on the mission, they have this montage of him experiencing things. And some, some people pointed out like, you know, he, oh, like subway trains, they, they had those. I, I forget if it was that exact, but I think it was that. They had those in 1917. So that wouldn't have been, you know. Now, recent comic book movies since after Trump was elected Chris criticized aspects of him through the villains and or framework issues. And, you know, this one does through wish fulfilling, appealing to our worst aspects, including greed, Maxwell, and yeah, the character of Maxwell Lord. And yeah, so I'm gonna, like, based on when they were filmed, I don't think that BVS or Suicide Squad had a Trump criticism. You gotta remember, everyone thought Trump would lose 2016, but Wonder Woman won. The villain, either of them, is cruel, impossible to please, has delusions of grandeur. The hero is someone who inspires hope. Same thing for Justice League. Aquaman, the villain, is 
technically the next in line to rule a certain country, but his hatred of anyone who wasn't born in that country means that it is necessary to stop him. Shazam, the villain, was abused by his father, leading to an inferiority complex and an obsession with proving he hasn't done something wrong. He loves getting revenge and is merciless towards the powerless, including children. Birds of Prey, the villains and antagonists are misogynists. Now, let's see. And... Yeah, so the, you know, the hundred years walked away from mankind is now walked away from human connection. But she was doing hero stuff. Now. Let's see. Both Monster and the first Wonder Woman movie has a lot of empathy f with the character, in both cases the female character, main character, who has a hard time fitting in with the rest of people and can be very awkward around them. It both has empathy for that character and derives some humor that isn't mean-spirited from that character. I wonder if this... Yeah, this movie does kind of do that with, with Steve. It does also do it with Barbara, but with Barbara it does ultimately, you know, she does become a villain. One of the countless things to love about the first movie that I love about the first movie is that after Superman the DCU is made this Ayn Rand version of what people should strive to be rather than an actual hero, as he's traditionally depicted. Honestly, I would have settled for anything less than a sociopath. Anyway, after that, Wonder Woman actually does have Diana be this hopeful, sweet, loving character who sees the best in people and who heroically tries to save everyone. Like. I know that Zack Snyder, like he produced that movie, didn't he? Didn't he do some of the writing? Like the Wonder Woman solo movie feels like a refutation of Zack Snyder's assertion that you can't do Superman straight anymore. That you can't have someone that optimistic in a movie and for people to take that movie seriously. You know the the anyway. Obviously, the Birds of Prey movie, or Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. And no, I did not have to look that up. I remembered it easily because it's such a fun title. It's an incredibly different movie than either of the Wonder Woman, Woman, Wonder Woman movies, but it is very empowering for women and enjoyable and an excellent movie. I wish this movie was anywhere near as good. Let's see. Yeah, you know, overall... Birds of Prey is in some ways better than the first Wonder Woman, various reasons. Better better action, more fun group dynamics, more willing to display, empathize with, and accept very human behavior, even though it is perhaps sometimes self-destructive behavior, including especially by its female characters, which is frequently depicted in a very judgmental way in American movies. If you haven't watched it for a while, go watch Birds of Prey again. It's seriously amazing. You know, I, I rewatched it fairly recently because Harley Quinn is in both it and the Suicide Squad, and that worked for me as an excuse to rewatch it right before I watched the Suicide Squad for the first time. And yeah. Now the trailers don't really show any supporting ca uh, sorry a supporting cast as diverse and memorable. As the first one has, yeah, there there isn't really a lot of, you know, yeah, th this one focuses more purely on Diana, Steve, and the two villains. And I wrote, I mean, they don't have to do everything that the first movie did great in order to be a great sequel to it, but yeah, I, I don't think it would have made a lot of sense to try, to, as, as good as it was in, in the first movie, I don't think it would have worked well in this one. Now, let's see. You know, like, the first movie, you know, a Native American, a Middle Eastern man, and a Scottish man 
would be great if any of them were also women, but, you know, it certainly is more, like, there's there's a very long list of American movies which do not appear to think that Middle Eastern men are capable of just like basic humanity and then Wonder Woman one is like he's 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 just so nice. He's such a good person. I'm I'm not saying he never does anything you know not everything he does is right. Anyway. Now, early in the first movie, the Germans sent their villains to her shore. She left them bloody, bruised, and sore. She's Amazonian with power to defend. And... As many others have pointed out, Steve come back, comes back in another man's body, and yet Steve and Diana have sex, which is effectively raping that guy's body. No, the fact that it involves a woman making that choice doesn't mean it isn't rape. It is possible for women to rape men, despite the fact that largely men have more power due to power dynamics as far as gender go. It's especially silly to invoke that argument here, given that Diana is substantially stronger than a human man. No, the fact that Gal Gadot is attractive doesn't mean it's not cell rape. If he has a partner and wants to be monogamous, and they realize what happened, she might leave him. And who says he's straight? He might find women as unappealing sex partners as straight men find other men to be. And near the end, Maxwell Laura talks to the entire world through TV screens, asks everyone to make wishes. I'm not the first person to point out that obviously a huge chunk of the world does not speak English, but to be fair, it's not like it's a piece of fiction with magic where you can just make up the rules. I mean, what are they going to do? Have him speak different languages depending on which TV he appears on? How would they possibly show that? What, like, show his face on TVs in different countries? Have the words spoken always be in the language of that people? This is an X-Men Apocalypse. Seriously, X-Men Apocalypse is hot garbage, but that is at least one aspect that they got right. And yeah, so close to the end, Max uses television to make everybody make a wish. But we were told he had to touch people while they make the wish for him to be able to grant it. Why not just rewrite those rules so that, like, at, like, they could make it that the the requirement is people are looking at the person and then making the wish and then you know at first max just can't either he can't get himself on tv or you know maybe he doesn't think of it and then near the end he gets access to the technology that allows him to like you don't even have to check they they the the thing of you know oh you can be on all tv screens you know, I, I'm not sure that actually exists, but that is much more easily acceptable as far as believability goes than the idea that he actually, that that's, that, the, that he is touching all of them because of the satellite thing. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And it didn't have to be that way. All they had to do was change it. Like, yes, I know, usually it's the, you know, you have to touch the thing and then make the wish. But why not just make it be, if you're looking at the person and you, you make the wish, then it works. But it's not enough to just have a picture. It has to be looking at the person. And then suddenly he realizes it would work if I was on TV. It, it doesn't have to be in person. Now, in the climactic fight between Diana and Barbara, Diana is trying to reach Barbara, trying to awaken her humanity, instead of just trying to destroy her physically. The president, who's apparently Reagan, if you're going by, who was actually U.S. president in 1984, wishes for more nukes. He did, in reality, greatly increase the amount of nukes America had, but that was because of the military-industrial complex. Like... If he didn't actually get anything out of getting more nukes, I'm not sure he would have cared, but, you know, that is, unfortunately, at times, the movie is superficial. So, Diana's speech to the world, including the real world outside, did I, did I, am I remembering it right? Did she actually, please put in the comments, 
Did she break the fourth wall? Did she look directly into the camera lens? Oh, for the love of... The speech is terrible. You know, she, she says it's important not to be greedy. If you want something, you really ha you have to really work for it. You can't just wish it were so. Which is definitely something that you need to tell people in the year 1984. In the year 2020, I mean, I guess the MAGA crowd, but I don't think we're really living in an age where people are unwilling to put in effort and just spend all day dreaming about how great things could be. We're living in an age where most people agree on most of the major issues. Mind you, I said most, not all. But if you look at polls in America, if the word progressive isn't attached, then a majority of the country want progressive priorities. The problem is a lack of political will. The problem is that corporations have way too much power. The movie could easily have been rewritten to be about politicians refusing to do what we the people clearly express we want them to do because they're too beholden to their donors. I mean, if you want to say we don't have all the technology to deal with climate change let change yet a lot is being invented and a lot more a lot could be done with that if the politicians would just agree to it the movie could be about corporations refusing to do the right thing because they care more about profits than the future of the planet and how much they're hurting people you know what you didn't you wouldn't have to take the movie out of the 80s to do a lot with those themes the original robocop is highly critical critical of corporations acknowledging how bad they are making things for regular people and while it's not from the 80s it almost is the you know all the president's men from 1976 about watergate is about political corruption so like but making the movie about like regular people have to stop wishing that things would just be work like it's just it's offensive like that's not the problem the prop like it sounds like like this is this is the argument that like conservatives would make like ah oh, people just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps you know and it doesn't seem like the movie is trying to be conservative you know the the like it has some you know there is there is a certain cynicism expressed that like all these you know so like, is there a single selfless wish made by the... And anyway, the... Yeah, you know, the... the it, it's really... I agree. The people of the... Like, I, I... You know... I didn't live for very much of the 80s. I wasn't born yet for quite a bit of it, but... When I watch movies, it does seem like people were obsessed with money, with status. People, you know, and, and certainly the, the stock market, clearly, stockbrokers thought that they, you know, just wanted more, more, more. And, and if you want to say, just, I realized that, like, you know, the movie... When they made the movie, they didn't know that Corona was going to be a thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm not blaming them for the fact that, you know, obviously during Corona, like the idea that, ah, oh, just, you know, you got to stop wishing for the, you just, you got to go out there and make the, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. But you can't do that with, if, if you have to stay inside as, so that people don't die, you know. But even without it, like, I, did, I can't think of any time in recent years where just like the idea where, where a substantial chunk of people needed to be told you have to actually do things. You can't just wish things were a certain way. You know, it's just, it's baffling. Anyway, moving on. So when, when Diana makes the invisible jet, invisible she says that she made a coffee cup invisible and then lost it at least you didn't buy, build an entire invisibility machine i get that part of the reason the ending has diana reaffirm the value of truth is that that's part of what she stands for you know i've, I've let's see is it 
you know, truth, justice in the American way, that's Superman, but yeah, like truth and empathy and, you know, things like that. But I do think it was a mistake to focus on an, the kind of truth that the movie focuses on, saying that people shouldn't want an easy fix. I think there's an easy rewrite. Make it that part of the reason the villains are succeeding is because of a lie, and at the very end she unveils that lie, everyone looks at the villains different, you know. But, yeah. Now, okay, so I'm scrolling, let me see if I can find something else, yeah, I copied in a bunch of stuff that, now. And that was, oh, never mind, I do have some more, okay, I'm just going to skim through this, I'm going to try not to leave any dead air. Yeah, I, th I think the movie would be a lot better if there was this thing of like, and, and it's, it wouldn't even take much of a rewrite, because Maxwell Lord is basing a lot of this stuff on lies, you know, it's just that early on, like, the, the thing, ah, what's the word? Like, he makes a lot of his earlier claims true, you know, because of the, the wishing stone, but the, ah. yeah, if, if there was just a thing, If, if he built something based on a lie, and then she revealed that lie, I, th I think that would have been the way to go. But that is everything. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch. On the screen right about now, I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which is currently What If. And yeah, these days the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like video more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching. As I enjoyed watching and recording. And I'll catch you next time.